but very little information, I suppose, in terms of exactly mechanistically how it's set up and how it's used, unless, of course, you download my article off the website, All of Fiber Infection Model Principles and Practice. So today I'm just going to run through briefly how it's set up, how it's used, I'm not going to be doing anything extremely data intensive and a lot of really perhaps things that you know already, but I just kind of want to show you the, the geometry and the usage of the system. So of course you know that antibiotic resistance is a, uh, a major health concern worldwide. Uh, my takeaway from this meeting is that uh, Europe is much more active and uh, cognizant of the issues involved with uh, antibiotic resistance than we are in the United States. And so hopefully we can transfer some of that energy back to the U.S. So of course it's uh, definitely a, a public health issue. Um, and there is certainly a lack of new antibiotics. Uh, all these simple ones have already been discovered. The potent negative of action of most antibiotics is going to be cell wall synthesis inhibition. Uh, and uh, there's only so many ways that you can stop building a wall. Uh, also, there's not a lot of economic uh, motivation for the development of new antibiotics. And that's probably one of the primary reasons in the US why we're not as active as in Europe. Uh, because uh, since we have private health care instead of uh, public health care, the costs are being absorbed by people who aren't really understanding that they're absorbing the cost. And also, it's just as complicated to get a cell therapy or, uh, or uh, anti-cancer therapy as it is an antibiotic approval process. Uh, so this is also inhibitory to the development of new uh, antibiotics. We had a long presentation about the MIC and what it's good for. Um, I won't go into any more detail about that now, but certainly it still remains one of the primary indicators of antibiotic efficacy. Um, but uh, MIC is not a time course dependent measurement of antibiotic function. So we know that antibiotic function is both concentration dependent and time course dependent. So uh, I'm not real good at drawing, but let's just imagine that the uh, areas under the curves, these two curves, is the same, but will have profoundly different effects in terms of uh, antibiotic activity. So we need to have assays in which we have both time and concentration control. Um, so we have the time kill assay, which is in use, we have the mouse fly model, uh, which is in use, and so then we have the hollow fiber infection model. Time kill assay is kind of messy. It's an open system that's not going to be real good for really pathogenic uh, bacteria. Um, and as we, if we have a short half life, we need a lot of diluent to use a lot of bacteria. Um, so, not really an effective method, uh, method for looking at time, of course, antibiotic efficacy. We have a mouse fly infection model, which is still uh, uh, in common use. It's not a very nice assay. We have to pick the poor little mouse and infect him with something, and maybe uh, the uh, progress of the infectious pathogen is similar to humans. Maybe it's not. Uh, maybe the drug metabolism is similar to humans. Maybe it's not. Uh, if we get one time point per mouse, which is not very nice, take a little leg and, and zig it up in the blender and spread it out. Um, but it will give us some information about time, efficacy, and concentration dependency of antibiotics. So the hollow fiber infection model is intended to redact to its fundamental components the antibiotic activity profile. Um, so it's based on the principle. Okay. So it's based on the principle that each one of these little fibers is uh, uh, like shaped like a drinking straw. It's a filter. They're about 200 microns in diameter. We need a diameter over here and there. Wall thickness is 10, 10 microns. We want a very thin wall for rapid diffusion of com compounds across the fiber. Uh, so we seal up these fibers in the ends of the hollow fiber cartridge and seal them up with the minimum grade polyurethane so that, and then trim it off so anything that goes through the end of the cartridge necessarily goes through the insides of the fiber. And typically we'll put the bacteria on the outside of the fiber. So you may recognize that this is also what we'll call a 3D artificial capillary bioreactor. So it's going to act like a 
different categories in terms of its exchange properties uh, with the extra capillary space, the space outside the fibers. So we have a very tight molecular cutoff. We have either a 5 GD or a 20 GD molecular cutoff. The 20,000 Dalton is the most commonly used because of its extremely high gross filtration rate. We also cast the fibers with little waves in them. So they push each other apart inside the cartridge housing and give us uniform spacing of the fiber bundle inside the cartridge. Uh, we've done some analyses and the uh, diffusion of small molecules across this 20 kD molecular cutoff. I hesitate to use the term instantaneous, but we'll say it's very rapid under the five seconds of exchange in the 20 mil volume of the extra capillary space of the cartridge. So raw three circulates to the inside of the fiber, bacteria is on the outside of the fiber. Uh, we can then add and remove our antibiotic compound from the central reservoir in a time course dependent fashion. So you can see here the basic schematic of the hollow fiber infection model. We have the central reservoir, and it's good to keep the central reservoir volume small, uh, 100 mils or less. This both affects the amount of compound that you require and also the amount of diluent that you require in the long run with the cartridge. So the broth recirculates. The idea is that concentration of drug in the extra capillary space in the cartridge where the bacteria is equals concentration of drug in the central reservoir. It's actually very simple, but it can be a complex process to set up in the lab. So we have most people will do a bolus infusion of their compound. Uh, we can also uh, model the uh, various routes of administration by using a syringe pump so we can look at IV versus inhalation versus uh, topical administration, whatever. And then we can add diluent to mimic the elimination curve of the drug. And we can do this multiple times. So we can look at dosage profiles that inhibit the emergence of resistance, dosage profiles that give us optimal total kill, Cetera. The key to the system is the reservoir cap, five port reservoir cap. We have two large tubes that recirculate the medium, and then we have a diluent in, which can also be used as a dosing port. Uh, an easy way to make a T valve is to take a three way sock cup and break the valve, just a little tip. Uh, and then the diluent out. It's crucial that the volume of the central reservoir remain constant. And so the way that we do this is by raising the diluent out tube to the level that we wish the reservoir to remain constant at. And we have two separate parasolic pumps, one for diluent in or drug in and one for diluent out. And the key is to have the diluent out flow rate to be 5%, no more than 5% faster than the diluent in. And this way, we can maintain the constant volume of the central reservoir at the set point that we've, de we've delivered. So the advantages are that it is, in fact, a closed biosafe system. We have people working in, in BSL-3 labs with unattenuated TV and playing in some kinds of these really nasty bugs. Uh, we do multiple samples over time, basically as many samples as you'd like. Over a 24-hour period of time, depending on how many graduate students you have in the labs, uh, large numbers of organisms can be uh, can be cultured. So we're looking at clinically relevant numbers of bacteria, 10 to the 8 per mil, and 20 mils of 10 to the 8 per mil. So two times 10 to the 10 bacteria total, significant load. Uh, and if we're looking to um, define emerging resistance, of course, the more bugs you have, the more likely you are to be able to find resistance strains. We can precisely stimulate human PKPD. Of course, uh, this implies that like if we have a de novo compound, we need to know from what the PKPD in humans is. Sometimes we can extrapolate this with a new compound, but it's sort of one thing that we need to know for a new compound is what, what the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics in a human is, because that's what we're trying to do is mimic human activity. We can do uh, total kill. Total kill is simple to do. Remove the antibiotic and wait a couple days and see if something grows back. Very simple. It's a single-use disposable, reliable uh, cartridge. Uh, in my mind, um, the issues of antibiotic resistance will be addressed tomorrow, next year, the next five years. It's going to be multiple drug therapies since we have not many new compounds coming online. 
So this is an ideal method for looking at and defining both areas of synergy and antagonism for different two drug models. Um, and as I said, we can do both the elimination and the dosing curve. And we can look at bacteria at different growth stages and also co-culture with mammalian cells if necessary. We have already publications out there where we're doing tuberculosis in conjunction with macrophages. One of the issues that we see with the Hallsweiger infection model, of course, is going to be non-specific binding to different fiber types. And the polysulfone fiber is a solvent-based fiber. So if you have a drug that requires a lot of solvent, like DMSO or chloroform in a solution, it's possible that these fibers could be compromised by the amount of solvent in the um, circulating media. Uh, so we do have a cellulosic fiber that is more resistant to solvent not as good in terms of its transfer characteristics. We also have a PVDF fiber that has a 0.03 micron pore size. If we're looking to remove beta lactamase and these kinds of things, we have these types of fibers available as well. This just shows the kind of predicted and resulting antibiotic concentrations. Uh, we have various ways of setting up the system. Uh, you on the outside, pump goes in the incubator, uh, waste low, so we like to move from high to low. We also worked with the system in our own chamber, no problem. Okay. There we go. Um, we can put it into a light, preventative uh, light type gamma if the drug is light sensitive. Um, two drug model, we just need to infuse the longer half life drug using a syringe pump to mimic its bioavailability. Uh, this is just going to show that we look at dosing uh, profiles. <coughs> We just general data, hit the bug with one gram, one dose a day, and has a chance to go back, divide the dose up, four doses per day, we can demonstrate now that we can get more effective killing the bacteria over time. Uh, some of, we also have some antiviral agents that we can work with. Uh, there's been some comment about clinical translation of these data to the clinical setting. This is something that we're particularly happy with. This is some work out of uh, Tuami Gumbo's lab where he showed that combination therapy resulted in more rapid uh, uh, reduction of TB load in pediatric patients. Pediatric TB is a different distribution of organism when you have adult TB. Um, again, I don't understand this graph, but it's very colorful and it's basically just showing that we have areas of antagonism and areas of synergy in a two-drug model. Um, EMA has already endorsed uh, the uh, hollow fiber infection model for TB. Uh, FTA is working on it. I go down and see the FTA every six months or so and say, how's it going? And they say, well, we're working on it. So hopefully we'll catch up to Europe. Uh, just to do this, I'm out of time, but we're <laughs> <laughs> most, most advanced way to do so, culture, and thanks very much for your time.